This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you again for listening to Beyond the Big Screen. A huge thanks goes out to Michael Meyer, author of Benjamin Franklin's Last Bet. Links to learn more about Michael Meyer and his books can be found at his website, inmanchuria.com, or in the show notes. A great way to support Beyond the Big Screen, there's two ways. You can join us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash beyond the big screen. Patreon really helps make this show sustainable, and there's great benefits to you. Special thanks goes out today to our executive producer on Patreon, Alex. Another great way to support the show is by leaving your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts. We're a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, and it features great shows like Scott Rank's History Unplugged Podcast, and more about that can be found at ParthenonPodcast.com. You can contact me, find out how to find us on social media, and join our email list at the website A2ZHistoryPage.com. I thank you for joining me again beyond the big screen. I am very excited to have Michael Meyer on the show today to talk about the one of the largest and most charismatic characters in American history, Benjamin Franklin. Michael Meyer is author of Benjamin Franklin's Last Bet, The Favorite Founding Father's Divisive Death, Enduring Afterlife, and Blueprint for American Prosperity. Michael is the author of numerous books and articles. He was a Fulbright scholar and a professor and is a professor of nonfiction writing at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you, Michael, so much for uh, joining me to talk about the amazing life and afterlife of Benjamin Franklin. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. I have a kind of a personal story about some of the things you've talked about. I lived in Philadelphia for a while, and I would walk by Benjamin Franklin's grave almost every day to meet my wife for uh, work, and it just almost became like a a normal thing. I think a, a good place to start is what's maybe the standard telling? If you had to tell somebody who's maybe not from the U.S. and give them a, a broad overview of who is Benjamin Franklin. That's a great question. He was large and contained multitudes. Um, you know, you can divide his, like he lived quite a long time. You know, he, he, he straddled the 18th century. So he's 84 years old. And the first 42 years of his life are devoted to business. And he's, you know, he would never call himself self-made. He was an autodidact for sure. Uh, you know, apprenticed in a print shop and in his father's candle making shop in Boston, fled his brother, got down to Philadelphia on a boat. Um, and then, you know, became the legendary Benjamin Franklin, worked as a printer, um, benefited greatly from his wife's uh, assistance and her family. Um, and as he was being an entrepreneur in Philadelphia with his print shop and starting the Pennsylvania Gazette newspaper, which became the largest newspaper in the colonies and poor Richard's almanac, um, he's also tinkering. He's an inveterate tinkerer. He's always looking to improve things around his house. Um, he invents things as you know, various as uh, the lightning rod, the catheter, swim fins. Um, he invents a musical instrument called the harmonium. He perfects the odometer. And I think one thing really interesting about him is that he refused. There was no patent office at that time, but he could have applied for an uh, exclusive commercial license for his inventions. But he felt very strongly that as we benefit from the technology others create, Others should benefit from our own technology. And so I think we could credit him as a forerunner of the open source movement as well. So at age 42, he retires from business and he decides to devote himself almost wholly to philanthropy and starts a great number of charitable causes that you walking around Philadelphia could still see. Uh, the Pennsylvania Hospital is still there. The Penn Philadelphia Academy, which became the University of Pennsylvania, is still there. The American Philosophical Society is still there, the great library next to Independence Hall. And then finally, the last act of Franklin's life is he becomes a diplomat. Um, he spent nearly 30 years of his life, as she is his older years, overseas, living in either London or in Paris, uh, the latter time you know, lobbying on behalf to try to attract French support for uh, the war. Um, and then, you know, his, his last dying act, he had two great sort of 
pen strokes to end his life. The first was he presented the first petition for the abolishment of slavery to the Senate. Franklin was a slave owner. His family held up to seven slaves uh, that worked in his print shop and around the house. Um, uniquely among founders, and I think old people in general, he became more progressive as he aged um, and realized that 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 his slave owning was a uh, uh, mark on his on his legacy and he wanted to repudiate that and of course after fighting for liberty it was hypocritical to say well we should still have the the slave trade in the liberated united states so that was one thing he did the second thing he did which we're going to talk about today is he added a final codicil to his will um a, a dying bet as i put it on the survival of working class tradespeople for the next 200 years it's really interesting that he was born in Boston in the early 1700s, and then he moved to Philadelphia. And those are two areas that had really stark different uh, <laughs> cultures and just everything. It's almost like a, moving to a, a foreign country in a lot of ways for him. What made Franklin move from, from Boston to Philadelphia? He was indentured to his older brother and he hated the work. He wanted to get out of it so badly. And so a couple of years into his indentured indentures, um, he fled. He ran away. It was illegal at the time, but he still broke uh, the bond. Uh, he hoped to go to New York City. That was the thought. And New York was smaller than Philadelphia at the time. Um, Broadway was still a cattle trail if, 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 if it even existed at that time, but he ended up continuing onward to Philadelphia, which you're right. These are polar opposites, these towns, you know, Boston known for its academies, um, for its genteel society, very old England sort of sort, you know, Puritan driven, whereas Philadelphia was a bustling port and became the largest city in the United States, well, in the colonial Americas, while, while Franklin was living there, and then in the United States, much more diverse, uh, much more entrepreneurial in spirit. You know, in the book, I talk about how you could trace a lot of the, the men who knew Franklin's father, you know, 100 years ago, those descendants were the new mayors of Boston, you know, the Quincy's, Quincy the fourth and Quincy the fifth. Whereas in Philadelphia, you know, the person they elected to serve as mayor 16 times was a person who uh, professed hated learning and had apprenticed as a hatter. You know, <laughs> he, it was just a very, very different, um, a very, very different backdrop. You're right. And I think had, had Franklin stayed in Boston, he couldn't have become the entrepreneur, inventor um, and diplomat, you know, sort of statesman that he became. He also spent some time in London. What did uh, what was he doing in London? How did he get to London? And what did that maybe add to his character? I think, you know, how did he get to London? The first time around, it was really carelessness. When he was a young man and had, had landed in Philadelphia, um, the provincial governor had, had noticed something in this young man and sent him on a ship over to London bearing letters of credit to buy a printing press to bring back. And we can imagine Franklin's horror after the six week voyage and he's on the ship's deck and they're emptying the mail bag, you know, on, on the deck. And he's realizing there is no letters of credit. There are no letters of credit. And so he's marooned in, in London and he has to work his way back to Philadelphia. And the way he does that is he apprentices or he works actually, he wasn't apprenticing in a print shop setting type. Uh, the London workers called him the water American because he refused to drink beer as they did during the day. <laughs> he drank water and they were amazed at how much more productive he was. Um, and he also figured out pretty quickly that lead poisoning was probably endemic in these print shops. And so he handled trays of lead with gloves instead of with his bare hands and, and felt healthier because of it. Later on in his life, he was sent to London as an agent for the Pennsylvania colony, sort of the the diplomat for, for Pennsylvania. Um, and then, you know, when he was there, he fell in with the, you can still visit his house. It's quite interesting. It's right between Trafalgar Square and the Thames. It's been restored. Um, but you can picture him while he was living there, you know, not only having dealings with, with the court, um, but also the leading scientists and thinkers of that time. So he became much more cosmopolitan while living. In As an American who's grown up basically with Benjamin Franklin my whole life, I, but certainly not an expert like you are. He seems like he's so many contradictions. He's 
And I don't know if there are necessarily contradictions or not, but he's got layers. He's a Bostonian, but he's also a Philadelphian. He's a tradesman, but he's also a a, a diplomat and a scholar. How can you, if you had to put him in a box, what would you, how would you describe him? American, right? Like <laughs> you just described, just described Americans. You can't put them in a box. Um, it's a really good point you mentioned because, you know, it, I think he, and I think Franklin used those, those uh, that sort of duplicity to his advantage. So when he was in Paris, for example, during the American Revolution, he very much played up his quote unquote Americanness, right? He he grew his hair, he's in his late 70s uh, at this time, grew his hair long to his shoulders, refused to powder it. Um, he would wear the stockings to court, but you know, he he when Marie he liked to wear a, a Martin, a, you know, Martin fur hat instead. But when Marie Antoinette saw him at a, at a at a court function, she asked a courtier, you know, what is Franklin's backstory? And he said, Oh, he's an apprentice and so forth. And she she sized him up and sniffed that had Franklin, you know, grown up in France, he could have risen to at most a bookseller. And again, I think Franklin liked that. I think he played off that sort of you think you have me figured out, but there's much more going on here than meets the eye. And I think he also, you know, he had the the two things that I think a lot of listeners and certainly myself can can relate to, which is sort of imposter syndrome. If I could sort of psychoanalyze him for two from 200 years away, but you know, he he always was scratching the phantom limb of the education he didn't receive. And he freely admits in his memoir that although he raised money to start the first library in the American colonies, he really was the chief. <laughs> he was the, no one benefited more from that library than himself, right? That he was always studying and learning in it. Um, and I think he used that sort of, that sort of duplicity. I, I hate to use that word, but these sort of layers to offset, you know, he was much older than the other founders. Um, he was not landed gentry. He did not, in, you know, like George Washington, marry into a family that had a large plantation. Um, he did not, like John Adams, marry into a genteel family, you know, of lawyers and, and Boston blue bloods or Massachusetts blue bloods. And so I think he always felt sort of removed from the societies in which he roamed, except for what he called the leather apron class. And even at, you know, when he was, the months before he died, he ensured that his will began, I, Benjamin Franklin, printer. And he put his trade before anything else, before state, you know, diplomat or former governor of Pennsylvania. And then this codicil, this bet he places um, at the end of his will is wholly aimed at, A, showing his fellow founders, look, we need tradespeople in our government. And B, I hope they last, you know, I hope I can support them for the next 200 years. And now, a brief word from our sponsors. It's something interesting about Benjamin Franklin, again, to psychoanalyze him after all this time. I know a lot of people who are kind of in the tradesmen, like my father. He was a printer. Maybe there's something to do with printers. He didn't have a ton of formal education, but he was very auto, autodidact, like in a, in a lot of ways, I mean, I'm not comparing him to Benjamin Franklin by any stretch of the imagination, but I wonder with Benjamin Franklin, when he, does it come across in his writings or anything of somebody who obviously he can stand with any of the founding fathers, but he wasn't genteel uh, gentry, like you said, he wasn't educated at the best of the universities. Did that somehow come across in how he felt about himself? <laughs> I think, it, you know, it's funny what you say about your father. My mom's in construction. I've always said I'm the failure in the family because I'm an English professor now. But, you know, she can read blueprints and I can't. So who's the smarter person? My mom can price a job. I can't. Right. Who's the smarter person? I'd say my mom is. So with Franklin, you know, that's a really good question you ask. Like, how did he educate himself and how did he become? Can you see it in his writing? The answer is yes, because he he freely plagiarized. We would say he would say borrowed. But now, you know, if I were grading him in my class, I'd say he plagiarized great thinkers and great writers. And he he says this, you know, in in his in his memoir that the way he learned to write is he would get these bound volumes of the Spectator, which was a great kind of the New Yorker or the Atlantic of of London at that time, and he would he would read the articles and he would close the bound volume. This is when he was a teenager. And he would try to replicate what he just read. And he would find often, as he said, that his version would improve upon the original. 
the thoughts that he started having, right, would be better than the ones he had read. But he did this with Daniel Defoe. He loved Robinson Crusoe. He took a lot of his early ideas for philanthropic works right from a Daniel Defoe essay. You know, it's creating a, an insurance society for widows who lost their husbands at sea, um, for creating, you know, um, uh, fire insurance, firefighting brigades, uh, and so forth. He took those ideas right from Defoe, and, and he admitted that later. And I should add, I think what's what something that was really fun for me to discover is that this brilliant idea to, to fund young entrepreneurial tradesmen for the next 200 years and setting up their own businesses, Franklin stole that idea as well. There was a French essayist and philanthropist who very much admired Franklin and wrote an essay uh, instead of poor Richard, it was fortunate Richard, uh, about a, a boy who decides to leave some money behind. And over 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, compound interest makes it multiply. And so he starts saying things in the essay like, I want to create a bank for, the, for, for Europe. So there'll be something called the European Union. Um, so it will cease wars between places. And in this, in this essay, which Franklin admired, and he praised the writer for it, um, he also talks about, I want to create a fund that will help young tradespeople. Maybe we could talk a little bit about um, some of his connections, because he made uh, connections all over him. One of the people that you, I uh, read about that was really fascinating was his connection with Dr. Samuel Johnson. And Samuel Johnson yeah. is uh, a, a pillar, a tower of learning. How did, uh, do, do we get a sense of what their relationship was? Well, Franklin tr tried to hire Dr. Johnson. And, you know, I think if he had succeeded, um, Dr. Johnson, we, we could still not visit his house in London today, right? And look at and, and read Boswell's great biography of him. Franklin was starting the Philadelphia Academy, which became the University of Pennsylvania. And he felt um, unable to write a curriculum. And he, he told, he wrote Johnson this in, in London saying, you know, I only have two years of formal schooling. My schooling ended because I couldn't afford the books. Um, I'm totally unfit to plan an English curriculum. I'd like to hire you to come over from London and start this up. And Johnson at that time, you know, he he begged off. He said, well, I, I, you know, I'm just, I'm also just a rural kind of bumpkin. And although he was living at that time in the greatest, largest city in the world, um, just said he didn't want to come. And I think Johnson later professes his great hatred of Americans. And partly this is because of slavery, but secondly, because of the revolution, it probably wouldn't have ended well. Um, so instead of Dr. Johnson, Franklin hires and a uh, uh, minister he's never met and has him come over from England. And this man becomes Franklin's greatest enemy and nemesis. And ironically, you know, there was no state funeral for Franklin and his eulogy was not read until nearly a year after he died. And in Philadelphia, the person they chose to deliver that eulogy was this hated minister um, that Franklin had brought over from England to run the Philadelphia Academy. Maybe we can talk a little bit about Franklin's personal life. I think that's an aspect that um, you delve into a lot. And that I found um, that I learned uh, so much more than I uh, had ever known. Maybe uh, tell us a little bit about his family. I, you know, he, he was one of 17 children and he and his sister, Jane, who was the baby were the two closest. And he wrote more letters to Jane throughout his life. And a, a lot of the ways we know a lot about Frank Franklin, by the way, is a joy to write about, but also a curse because not only, you know, the, the bookshelf sagging of, of, exhaustion with all the books on him. Um, he left behind nearly 10,000 letters, either to him or from him. Those have been digitized. And so you can sit and look for keywords. You can look online and find these things. But it's really his letters to Jane that we know a lot about his early life. But then the second great correspondent in his life is his wife, Deborah. And what fascinated me is, A, Deborah is often sort of shunted to the side rather quickly in the hagiographies of Franklin, almost all written by men. The cult of Franklin is almost exclusively male, I should add. And it shouldn't be because Jane was, you know, primary in his life. And secondly, was Deborah. And I was fascinated again to learn that they never had a church wedding. They were common law, you know, husband and wife. Uh, Franklin made sure in his will when he, when he staked these loans to tradesmen that they also had to be married uh, and at least 25 years old. It's no coincidence that Franklin 
was wed to Deborah at age 25. And he credits her, you know, in letters and in letters to friends as the great stabilizer in his life. But also she was not a helpmate assistant. She was absolutely the co-owner and co-boss of their business. And their original shop on Market Street, you know, sold sundries. They sold everything from chocolate to coffee to barrels of mackerel. And it's I was fascinated to look, you know, Deborah did not receive formal schooling either. Um, it's fascinating to look at her ledgers from the shop and realize that at that time, you know, exchange was going in, in Spanish coins, in British coins, in Dutch coins, in different denominations. And you could look at those ledgers and see how quickly she was calculating the exchange rates and giving change in different denominations and so forth. But really what we know of Deborah comes down to us through her surviving letters, which are very witty. And I try to re reproduce a lot of those, uh, as many interesting ones as I could in the book. Um, but it also comes down to us by how Franklin wrote about her in his memoir. Um, now, and it was helpful for me to remember and remind the reader that Franklin wrote his memoir to his son. He also wrote it when he was an old man in his 70s, um, had been separated from Deborah, you know, for almost over two decades with an ocean between them. And so it's not a book where he's going to start waxing philosophically or poetically or moaning over his beloved wife. So those are the two primary people in his family. And then you know, he's got his beloved daughter, Sally, who he made sure had all the, the best schooling she could find and musical training and so forth. And I was fascinated that he made sure in his will to stipulate that, A, not only could she receive the most valuable parts of his estate, but that he specifically laid out, this is for your use and ownership only. This is a half century before laws, you know, coverture laws are repealed in Pennsylvania. Up to that point, a married woman's property automatically became her husband's. And Franklin is saying directly in the will, De or Sally, this is yours and your husband can't have this. He also had a son, uh, William, he called Billy, who was probably not the child of Deborah. And another thing, a credit to Deborah is, you know, Franklin probably fi fathered William with a prostitute. Uh, the prostitute has been lost to history. We don't know who that was. Um, but you know, Franklin moves in with Deborah with an infant boy who um, called Deborah nothing but mother and Deborah called him nothing but son. But, you know, William was supposed to be Franklin's heir apparent, um, but he betrayed him in the Revolutionary War. And William had been appointed colonial governor of New Jersey and refused to cross over to the rebel side. Um, and for that, he was imprisoned in New York and he begged George Washington to be released to see his own dying wife. Um, he said, my hair has fallen out. My teeth have fallen out. I'm being kept in a cell uh, where condemned prisoners who are going to the gallows are usually kept. And Washington refused to parole him, to let, refused to let him go. William ended his life quite sadly, you know, not, not far from today's Trafalgar Square, uh, very bitter and, and very much in exile in London, bemoaning his choice he had made and his his distance from his father. And Franklin made sure, um, you know, he, he Franklin knew his will was going to be published and he made sure that the first bequest was to William. And because of William's actions toward him in the Revolutionary War, Franklin wanted William and the world to know that his son was going to receive his most, most worthless land in Northern Canada. Uh, current value zero, right? This tundra. Um, so he had a very fractured family. This is why the subtitle, the long subtitle of this book is his divisive death, because I didn't know until I got into this, how fractured his family was and how fractured his relationship was, was his, with his fellow founders as well. Yeah, that's, I, I'd love to talk about that because you look at him and he has a child out of wedlock. He's not formally married. He doesn't right. have the education. Like all these things pile up. What did people like the Adamses or the, <laughs> what did they feel about this guy? He's running, he's doing so much. I mean, uh, of the basic fabric of the country, his <laughs> fingerprints are all over it, but sure. he is not their guy. No, he's really not their guy. It's funny. He got along quite well with Washington. And when you walk into the Smithsonian uh, Museum of History in D.C., the first item you see in a glass case is Franklin's walking stick, which he left to General Washington uh, in his will because he felt quite proud of him for not only uh, you know his military actions, but then being elected as president um, and, and not becoming king. So he, he got along fine with Washington. And he had introduced um, people such as Kazimir Pulaski, and um, General Lafayette 
you know, to Washington from, from letters from Paris saying these are good soldiers and you should welcome them. So he got along with Washington. He got along with Jefferson. Um, you know, we, we can thank Franklin for the line that we hold these truths to be self-evident because he's the one that crossed out Jefferson's words and added self-evident. He got along with Jefferson, I think, on an intellectual level. Um, Adams, of course, drove him crazy. And I think even more so, Franklin drove Adams crazy. Um, and one of the reasons for that, you know, is that Adams was a lawyer and he believed in keeping regular hours and keeping up appearances. And one thing that drove Adams nuts when he and Franklin were both diplomats stationed in Paris is that Adams would show up at nine o'clock to his desk expecting to receive visitors and have business. And he'd find out that, you know, Benjamin Franklin was out till two or three in the morning uh, with the court um, entertaining, you know, playing music, playing cards, playing chess, telling jokes, drinking and so forth. And Adams, you know, he would seethe with that, that Franklin is getting all the credit. Franklin was the pampered, caressed favorite of the court, um, and he was not. Um, and, you know, is there some admiration in Adams's words? In, in sometimes you can read between the lines and see that he admired him. But for the most part, Adams, you know, long after Franklin had died, continued to attack him in print and even made fun of his you know, loan scheme to tradesmen, because Franklin had funded that with what Adams called this ridiculous idea that elected officials should not have a salary. Franklin refused to be paid when he was served as governor of Pennsylvania, and he took that salary and used that to stake his loan scheme for tradesmen. Franklin felt so strongly that, that officials should not be paid that he tried to convince his fellow delegates at the Constitutional Convention about this, because he said, if you have if our offices become places of profit, we're going to be ruled by greedy people who are driven by avarice rather than public service, who just want to elevate their own interests, their own business. Um, and Adam just thought that was the stupidest thing he ever heard. And maybe he has a point. You know, we could see either way. Adams or, or Franklin wasn't correct in everything uh, that he did. He did have some clunker of ideas as well. As far as his wealth, when Franklin died, how wealthy was he? And maybe compared to some of the other uh, people uh, of the founders. Sure. No, you know, this is tricky because like the, when they did the assessment on it's, it's, it's tricky for two reasons. One is um, taxes. When you look at tax records from that era, Franklin died in 1790. When you look at tax records at that era, you're only being taxed on tangible property, right? It's not on the things that it's not your income at all. It's just the value of the plot of the land you hold. Um, and unfortunately also the enslaved men and women that you hold because that you could see those, in the Philadelphia ledgers as well, especially with like Franklin's son-in-law, because Franklin made a point in his will: um, if you're going to cancel, if I'm canceling the debt that you owe me, you have to release uh, your the the person Bob that that you're holding in, in chains still, uh, which Franklin's son-in-law did. So it's difficult to assess wealth because when they when they did the inventory of Franklin's house, they only found about two pounds in coins total around the house. Um, banks were fledgling, you know, the dollar had not become official currency when Franklin died. Franklin participated in the first public offering um, for the, the Bank of the United States. He bought stock, but the stock exchange didn't open until 1792, so, uh, two years after he died. So the wealth we're measuring is sort of relative to, you know, what's on the books that are left behind, mostly property. Franklin was nowhere near as wealthy as George Washington. George Washington was married into his money. It was Martha Washington's holdings. Nowhere near as wealthy as Adams. Wealthier than Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton died. You know, he left his, he wrote a hastily uh, written will um, before he went to his duel. And it mostly consisted of all the people to whom he owed money. And his widow spent 12 years trying to secure a pension for his services um, during the revolution to pay off those debts. Franklin was wealthier than Jefferson. Jefferson was also deeply in debt um, because of his uh, construction of Monticello. So Franklin kind of falls in between. You know, he was wealthy in that after he stopped working as a printer at 42, he struck upon the ingenious idea of franchises. And so he franchised print uh, presses up and down the coast and would receive um, rent or dues, like fees for that annually. Um, he was wealthy in that he held this amazing gift from Louis XVI when he departed Paris 
you know, this portrait of the of the king surrounded by three tiers of, of, of diamonds, which he left to his daughter Sally. He was wealthy in that he owned a lot of scientific instruments. And I suppose he was wealthy because he didn't collect his salary for the three years he served as governor of Pennsylvania. But so not as wealthy as Washington and Adams, but not in debt either. Yeah. Upper middle class. I'd say low, I, I shouldn't say he was middle class. He was he was definitely wealthy when he died. I think it's worth examining just for a, a little bit, at least his his slaves and his ideas on slavery, because I had heard that he had slaves, but seven slaves. That's a lot of slaves. How did that fit in the context of Philadelphia at yeah. that time? I suppose one slave would be a lot of slave, right? If we're looking. Yeah, at well, him, yeah, that's true. One too many, right? Franklin is, again, like I, I say in the book that people always say like, oh, he's ahead of his time. No, Franklin was very much of his time. Um, and by what, by which I mean, you know, Philadelphia in the 17th century, when you disembarked on at the wharf at Market Street, the first thing you saw was a tavern that doubled as a slave market. And because Philadelphia was a port linked to the Caribbean um, and linked to the British ships, um, and was an entry point at that point for the colonies and for uh, uh, sort of the largest city at that time. Um, you know, it was something that you would see every day around Philadelphia. I think, especially, you know, I grew up in Minnesota and there was always this myth of like, oh, when you grow up in the North, you know, you're, <laughs> it was completely different. No, not at all. And, and in fact, you know, as we, as we go on in the story, I do talk about the fact that although Pennsylvania was one of the first states to abolish slavery, it did so in a very piecemeal fashion, right? So if you were already held in bondage, you couldn't be released. It was only, you know, in steps of banning the importation of slaves. And then a law was passed that saying if, if an enslaved person made it to Pennsylvania and lived continuously for six months there, they were free. When George Washington became president and Philadelphia was the capital, he quite insidiously rotated his enslaved people so that they'd come up from Mount Vernon live in Philadelphia and serve him and then be sent back to Mount Vernon at the five month, two week mark, right? Now, when you go to uh, Philadelphia, right? In the center of town, there's a big monument, you know, by the Constitution Hall there with those enslaved people's names on it, you know, saying this is what Washington did. And in the book, I talk, I quote from the letter where he tells um, his aide, like, this is what I'm doing. Keep it down. Right. Franklin, when he arrived in Philadelphia, you know, it was 17. He was born in 17. Uh, oh, four, oh, six, excuse me. So when he got there, it was 1720s. Um, one of the first things he made money on as a printer was, again, we talked about this duplicity in Franklin. On the one hand, he would print uh, wanted notices for runaway enslaved people and uh, auctions coming up for slaves. On the other hand, he also printed the first anti-slavery tract in the colonies, uh, by an abolitionist dwarf named Benjamin Lay, who called any slaveholder an apostate. And Benjamin Lay's activism went so far as to kidnap the child of a slaveholder and not tell the slaveholder where that person was so the slaveholder could feel that panic of being separated from their child, right? And in fact, Franklin admired Lay, and Deborah, his wife, admired Lay so much that for a gift, Deborah had a portrait of Benjamin Lay, the abolitionist, painted and hung in their home in Philadelphia. And that is now in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. But again, there's that double-minded disconnectedness where while Deborah is having Benjamin Lay's portrait painted to give to her husband, Franklin is in London with two of two men that he holds in chains, right? And you think like, why could you not see this um, differential going on in your mind? And why could someone who lobbied so vociferously for freedom and liberty at that time not speak out against the slave trade? And it's, a, it's I think it's an even more maddening because Franklin did write letters in the 1760s and 1770s to the British press saying, you know, we shouldn't be having sugar uh, we should be going without sugar in our tea because of the brutality of the slave trade um, and the sugarcane cutters and growers in the Caribbean. He was friends with Granville Sharp, the, one of the leading abolitionists of the 18th century. He was friends, very good friends, with Anthony Benizé in Philadelphia, who creates the first um, free schools for Black people in Philadelphia. And again, and Franklin funded these schools. And Deborah made sure that Othello, a young boy that was held by them, you know, went to one of these schools. And again, you think there's such 
naked duplicity here where you want to go back in time and say, can't you see what you're doing? The one hand really doesn't know what the other hand is doing. And I think Franklin, it eventually dawns on him how wrong this is and how insidious this is. And I should say he never, you know, that if, if when I say seven, it's a rough estimate between five and seven. And because we don't know the differences, it's often phrased as Franklin and his family, right? So serving the shop, serving the home and Sally and William and their brother-in-law and so forth. Um, and perhaps not all at one time, but certainly, you know, it's a, it's a fact. I find it remarkable that most of his biographies bury this. I, if you look in the, in, the, in the index for slavery, you'll see, oh, it appears you know, on page 290 or something. At the time, it was no secret. And when Franklin's grandson put out the big collections of Franklin's letters in, in the early 19th century, you know, Franklin's letters about slavery and talking about his own slaves, you know, writing to his mother about an incident that happened. These were in the front pages of these books. It was no secret. And so I do make a point in this book to put it in the introduction. Um, and it, Franklin was so, I think, chagrined and embarrassed by this that even before he was elected president of the Pennsylvania Abolition uh, Slavery, the Abolition Society, and presented the petition to, to Congress, in his memoir, he never mentions it. You know, his autobiography is credited as like, oh, it's the first work of American literature. But in the book, he does not say the word slavery or, or admit that he owned enslaved people. So he was never contrite about it? Like, oh, my bad. <laughs> Yeah, you don't see that in the letters. Actually, you don't see it. You see him. You see him saying it's a terrible trade. It's uh, you know, um, I I don't like having. He calls them Negro servants. He doesn't use the word slave. Um, but you don't see that that sort of self aware moment on the page of oh boy, what have I you know this is horrible. What have I done? Um, instead, he'll write about you know when he and his son William are are in London and William's uh, slave King runs away. They don't pursue him. Instead, Franklin writes about, oh, King is now living with a, an English woman who's attempting, you know, to, to convert him to Christianity and teaching him to play music. And it's sort of like, ha ha ha, frivolity, rather than saying, oh, we should probably do something to make sure King's going to be okay, right? Because this is another pernicious thing about slavery at that time in the 18th century, especially in, in cities like Philadelphia, that even if an enslaved person were released, they had no education, they had no equity. They were, had been long separated by their family. Um, and now it's like, well, great. Now what are you going to do, right? Um, and so this is, again, I think this is a, a real stain. Well, obviously it's a stain on our national character, but it's a stain on Franklin's legacy as well. And now a brief word from our sponsors. Did he maybe have a different idea? Because he was, Franklin was an indentured servant, but I know. at least with indentured servitude, you have some way out of it. Well, he ran away. Yeah, exactly. Well, you have a duration of time. That's a yeah. good point. Right. Yeah, that's the remarkable thing to me is that you'd think he would empathize with this. And again, I don't know the disconnect because, and the, again, like we can't, I don't, I don't want to let him off the hook on this at all. I don't want to say, well, you know, it wasn't a farm. It was a print shop. Oh, working in a print shop can be awfully grueling. And look, frankly, not having freedom is, is bad enough. So I don't, no, no way should he be excused or let off the hook. And in it is remarkable, though, again, like you say, like, why didn't this resonate to him? Or how could one hand not know what the other hand was doing? How can you be the first person in the colonies to print a book, you know, arguing for abolition, but in the same time printing notices uh, for auctions? Um, and this is maybe the maybe the the naked bare truth of, of Franklin's character until he grew older it was that it was for profit. You know, he looked at money first rather than than values or an ideology. That's so fascinating. I we, we could talk about that all day. Just that yeah. <laughs> aspect of his character, especially as compared to other founding fathers. But um, I, I would really like to talk. I think the the aspect of his endowment or his trust that he had given to Philadelphia and Boston in his will is so fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So as he as he lay dying, he remembers uh, this Frenchman's essay, you know, saying that if you put a little money away and let it compound over time, great miracles will happen. Uh, Warren Buffett calls it the Methuselah technique. He follows this as well. So Franklin decides I'm going to take the money that Pennsylvania owes me for serving as governor. And instead of giving that to my heirs and he writes in his will, I'm sorry, heirs, you know, I didn't inherit anything from my family. And so you're not going to inherit a lot from me either. Um, and he puts this money toward a loan scheme. And he says, I was helped greatly. 
I was educated in Boston in my two years of schooling, came to Philadelphia. I'm not self-made. It was only help for people giving me letters of credit, helping me, helping me buy equipment, getting me business and so forth, that I was allowed to start my print shop. And so he says, I'm going to um, leave a thousand pounds to each city, which is about $4,000 at the time. It's really difficult to do historical money um, conversions. It's a lot of money. It's equivalent to hundreds of thousands in, in purchasing power. And it was certainly a sizable chunk of his estate. And he says, uh, okay, here's what's going to happen. If you're a young tradesman and you want to open your own business, um, I will lend you 60 pounds. You have 10 years to repay it at 5% interest, which was below market rate. Franklin is here sort of a forerunner of microfinance, a term that's not coined for another 200 years. Um, and his idea was, is that it would be called, become what, we, what he called a sinking fund. So I loan this money out to, to tradespeople. They pay back every year with interest. That generates more principal. Uh, we keep the original principal intact as that joint gains its own, in, uh, earns interest, but we keep loaning it out to more people. And his idea was, is that this would run for a hundred years. And then after the first, on the centennial of his death, Boston and Philadelphia could cash out a large portion of this. He figured it would be a couple hundred thousand pounds at that point, millions in dollars. And they were supposed to agree to build something to benefit the common good. I can almost see him laughing at this after just going through the constitutional convention and <laughs> how hard it was to get Americans to agree on anything. Um, this notion that a hundred years that people in Boston and Philadelphia would get together and agree how to spend the money, what would benefit the common good. Then they were supposed to put some of the money back in a pot, loan it to tradespeople for another hundred years. And then on the bicentennial of his death, which would have been 1990, um, they were supposed to cash out this enormous jackpot and also build something for the common good. That's really progressive, you might say, but it's uh, <laughs> the thought that we're, I'm going to, in a way, pit these two cities against each other to, <laughs> to see who can, to have a competition of who can use this uh, money better and manage it better is really wow. interesting. And he played into their rivalry. I mean, he really did. He wrote in the will that if one, and he, he said, look, you can't pay anyone to manage the money. You have to have um, civic minded people step forward and manage this for free for 200 years. And he said, if either city refuses my term, the other city gets all the money. And so he immediately starts off from the start of like, okay, Boston and Philadelphia, the race is on. Who's going to do a better job elevating this rising generation of tradespeople? Which Franklin was doing this because he felt that that tradespeople were really the foundations of democracy, you know, that they, inter they really worked on the grassroots level. And every day they interacted with people of different classes, creeds, races, origins, and they were the ones that were sort of the great arbiters that could go to government and say, hey, you know what we need around here? We need a new sewer system. Or you know what we need? We need more opportunities for so-and-so. Um, and so Franklin felt that very strongly about that. And you're right. It's And the funny thing, I want to go back to the rivalry idea, is that almost immediately Boston and Philadelphia took different paths of how they were going to administer the loan, who they were going to loan money to. And as a result, I don't want to spoil the ending, one city's fund was much more than the other cities, but I'd argue the other city probably stuck to the letter of Franklin's intent better and what they tried to do with the money. In that day, was that something that had ever happened before where somebody just bequeaths money, a pretty decent chunk of money? I mean, like you said, it's hard to put a exact dollar figure, but it's a lot of money. It is. And I look back at Wills at that time and other people who had left money and stuff. And really, Franklin's the first. I mean, so much to the point where people would leave money to their church usually or charity, as it was called. There was no philanthropy. The, the word philanthropy wasn't there used then. It was often done through the church because, you know, Boston had 21 church. You had 21 parishes, 21 churches, um, and they would take care of their wards or their areas. It really, Franklin was the first to do something like this. And it inspired later, you know, what we think of as the great philanthropists of America, like Andrew Carnegie. Um, you know, Franklin's example here directly inspires Carnegie's own giving. And, and maybe, you know, some of this too, I, I, Franklin was very open with the fact that a lot of giving is done to make the giver look good. It's a public relations exercise. And I think, you know, Franklin's legacy was greatly dented uh, as he lay on his deathbed. Uh, his fellow founders thought he was too French, thought he had been an expatriate for far too long. Um, his abolitionist friends, you know, were were 
maddened by how long it took for him to convert to their cause. Um, and I think Franklin was aware of that too, that if I leave something like this as my will, it's going to burgeon my own legacy and make me look pretty good. People will talk about me for the next 200 years and they'll be reminded of my value. So but at the, he really had no idea who was going to be the trustee of this or how they were going to manage it. He didn't lay out any direction for that. No direction. He really did say, I, I, oh, I, he called it public spirited gentleman. You know, and and he does restrict, you know, like I said, he was very progressive in a lot of ways, but he initially restricted his gifts to men. And he did not put restrictions on religion, race, origin, you know, immigrant, anything like that. But he did put it on on sex. And the reason was, he said, is that a group of men had helped me in Philadelphia. So I want to repay that now. And it's fascinating in the book. I talk about this, too. I like the cult of Franklin is almost exclusively male. But. Over the years, as the trust goes on, different groups of people are advocating, like, we need to change his definitions, even not only to let women benefit from this, but even change the definition of what an apprentice is. When Franklin dies, you know, he had seen a demonstration of the steamboat on the Delaware River, and he was not impressed. He did not want to invest in it at all. And so he dies at a time when people are still doing everything by hand in America, you know, it's hand manufacturing. And then, you know, within a generation, Eli Whitney is mass producing rifles for the US government, along with his cotton engine, his cotton gin, as it's called, right? And so Franklin doesn't predict that mechanization and industrialization is going to, you know, subsume the apprentice system. Um, and so people over the, over the centuries, I find it fascinating how many Americans did step forward and say, well, you know what, we could change our definition of what an apprentice is. Or, and through the book too, I talk about, you know, the invention of the investment bank, the invention of the professional trustee, the invention of the trust fund, the invention of um, a philanthropic organization and a tax deductible, you know, like a ch charitable tax, uh, tax deduction for charity. All these things are being invented after Franklin's death, and yet they're all being applied to his trust to make sure it can survive. And I should say, you know, this isn't a spoiler either. By the end of the book, the reader will learn how his money is still in play today. His bet still goes on. You know, people are still receiving Franklin's money um, to learn skilled trades, which I think is just amazing. That is, I mean, that is an amazing part of his life. But I think it goes back to, and maybe this is a good way to wrap it up, he dies when he died. He's at his low point in yeah. his notoriety. How does his life and his um, his character get sort of rehabilitated after <laughs> that? I'm really glad you asked that because in the book too, I trace this rise and fall of his reputation. And you know, Virginia Virginia Woolf had once said that some stories are so important they have to be to be retold by every generation because they change, right? As the new person, and and in the book, I say that every generation seems to discover Franklin for themselves, and it's always a different Franklin. Mark Twain discovers the wit of Franklin and wants to model himself as this kind of quintessential American, you know, um, humorous. Um, immigrants, um, including Thomas Mellon, who creates the great Mellon banking empire, discover that, well, you know, when you're, when you come over and you don't know anything about your new city you're in, you just need to make good connections and work really hard. And Mellon had a life-size statue of Franklin in his, in his bank office all throughout his life. He admired him so much. Other people, you know, newspaper men and so forth, uh, including Horace Greeley, you know, the go, go West young man person, uh, supposedly said he's modeling himself after Franklin because of his journalism and his print career and so forth. And so, you know, and then in the, in, during the depression, Franklin is, you know, we become like this miserly, a penny saved as a penny earned Franklin. He becomes the poster child for sort of tight fisted middle-class values, which are really different than a guy who had a child at a wedlock with a prostitute, right? <laughs> and, and gave as much money to charity as he could. So, you know, throughout our history, his reputation and how we see him rises and falls. And I think if Franklin were alive today, he'd be fascinated by that story as much as he would, you know, what the state of his money and how this bet played out. Because as you know, I'm sure you saw it when you would wait for your wife by Franklin's grave. It is fascinating to me. You can sit on a bench by Franklin's grave and just watch the flow of people and the different kinds of people that are constantly coming to pay respects to him and put a penny on their grave. You know, it's an offering. And you see and hear and meet people not only from all over the United States, but really all over the world, that he still resonates in people's minds for whatever reason.
What do you think, what should be uh, the Franklin we understand for the 2020s, 200 years later? One thing that's missing from, you know, his biographies and his plaques is Franklin, the populist philanthropist. And I really do hope this book makes people realize that, you know, in his dying days, he saw himself ultimately as a tradesperson, that he belonged to the working class. And he wanted very much to make sure that the working class not only had support going forward, but had a voice in our democracy. Um, I think that's really important to remember and it's still resonant today, especially after COVID. And look, we're in this new era now. You know, one of the things I wrap up the book with is Franklin would be, I think, shocked at how the words we use, like the gig economy, freelancing, no contract hours, it all sounds so freeing. It sounds wonderful. Look, I'm a freelancer, you know? And instead that the people who are working those jobs and I've been in those jobs before lack stability and lack, um, you know, the ability to raise a family on those wages usually. And I think Franklin would be appalled by that. So I hope if nothing else, this book reminds people that look, you know, even 230 years ago, uh, one of the people that helped found this country was very much aware that the people who do the work are the ones we should be supporting. And I know work is a very loaded term, but I, in this way, I mean, the people you know, that most middle-class Americans don't think about until something breaks in their home, right? Or in their city. That's how my mom describes her job usually, right? No one thinks about doors or locks until they break and you need them fixed. And Franklin would be the one saying, ah, these are the people we should be thinking about all the time. 